This event has brought you to us, and it's brought to you by the Nanowick Institute for European Studies. My name is Clement Sedmak, and I serve as director of this institute, and uh, I'm very happy to do that. Our initiative in decolonizing scholarship was inspired by my colleague Meredith Jessen. It has been organized by my colleague Abby Louise. Um, and um, Abby has taken the project which wouldn't have gone anywhere into her very able hands. Thank you, Abby. As always, we owe a lot of gratitude also to Becca Prince, who is out there, I guess, monitoring our food. Uh, and she organizes our event so gracefully. This is already the third event in our lecture series, which allows us to look at the question of decolonizing scholarship from different angles and disciplinary perspectives. What does it mean to decolonize philosophy, theology, cultural studies, anthropology, political science, or the Kiyo School? Decolonizing is an intentional effort to rethink thinking, to unlearn learning, to create new practices. We plan to have some deep conversations that will hopefully inform our practices and end in a book. Any thought that's condensed in a book can be put aside and we can move on to new shores. On April 14, Marisol Lebron will talk about decolonizing scholarship in feminist studies and critical uh, race and ethnic studies. So that's two weeks from now. Today's event will have a great speaker and a great person introducing the speaker. The one to introduce our guest of honor will be my dear colleague and friend, Nanomic faculty fellow, chair of the Romans Language and Cultures Department, global citizen, role model, Alison Rice. And Alison, as you know, was director of the Institute for Scholarship and Liberal Arts at Notre Dame before she became chair of this department. She's a concurrent faculty member in gender studies and a faculty fellow of Kellogg, Krog, and Nanovic. Alison's most recent book, Worldwide Women Writers in Paris, constitutes an in-depth examination of the present proliferation of women writers of French from around the world. She would be a great speaker herself, but will humbly introduce another great speaker instead. Thank you, Alison, for introducing Laurent Dubois. Thank you so much, Clemens, and thank you for this wonderful, wonderful initiative. It's exciting for all of us in French and Francophone studies uh, to have such a guest here today. Um, and it's uh, just an honor to be here and to introduce Laurent Dubois, who is John L. Now III, Bicentennial Professor in the History and Principles of Democracy and Director for Academic Affairs of the Democracy Initiative at the University of Virginia. From 2007 to 2020, he was professor of Romance Studies and History at Duke University, where he founded and directed the Forum for Scholars and Publics. He has written about the Age of Revolution in the Caribbean with Avengers of the New World, The Story of the Haitian Revolution, a book published in 2004, and another work, A Colony of Citizens, Revolution and Slave Emancipation in the French Caribbean, 1787 to, 2000, uh, to 1804, also published in 2004, which won four book prizes, including the Frederick Douglass Prize. His 2012 Haiti, The Aftershocks of History was a New York Times notable book of the year. He has also written about the politics of soccer, which you might have guessed uh, by the image on our screens here uh, today, with Soccer Empire, the World Cup and the Future of France, published in 2010, and The Language of the Game, How to Understand Soccer, which came out in 2018. It sounds like a good title for some of us Americans who did not grow up with soccer uh, as our uh, national pastime. His work on the cultural history of music the banjo, America's African instrument, published in 2016, was supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, a National Humanities Fellowship, and a Mellon New Directions Fellowship. His most recent book is Freedom Roots, Histories from the Caribbean, published with University of North Carolina Press in 2019 and co-authored with Richard Turritz. His writings on music, history, and sport have appeared in The Atlantic, The Nation, The New Republic, The New Yorker, The New York Times, Slate, and Sports Illustrated. I am delighted to turn over the floor this morning to Laurent Dubois and hope that you will help me welcome him to the Nanovic Institute for European Studies at Notre Dame. Thank you. 
Well, thanks so much for this wonderful introduction. I've always had a, already had a fantastic morning with students and colleagues here. It's such a warm welcome, and I'm really pleased to be able to be part of this important series today. Um, this is a sneak preview of what I'll talk about at the end of the talk, um, which I, always, I think of as kind of like two approaches to how to decolonize the Marseillaise, which is you know, the French national anthem. Um, this is Lilian Thuram on the left, on my left, and Christian Carimbeu. They were two players on the, the great 1998 uh, um, French national soccer team that won the first World Cup for the nation. Um, and what's interesting here is that during that time, the far right uh, politician Jean-Marie Le Pen began attacking the team and saying that they weren't really French, right? That these were not true French people um, because of their background. And these two figures reacted very differently. So Christian Carimbeu, whose ancestors were from New Caledonia, some of them actually had been in the 1931 colonial exhibition on display in these kind of human zoos that demonstrated people, from, uh, sort of showed, showed people from the colonies. He kind of decided that he was going to refuse to sing the Marseillaise, right? That he would refuse to sing this song as a kind of gesture and memory to what his ancestors had suffered through French colonialism. Well, Lilian Thuram decided that he would sing the Marseillaise with particular verve, always <laughs> off tune, um, and always sort of was committed to that. And in fact, it's interesting because since then, players, there have been consistent debates amongst players and, and kind of in the media about what it means for, for players to sing or not sing the national anthem. You can think of how this resonates with protests, uh, the Colin Kaepernick protests in the United States. Um, so I just wanted to start there. But interesting, just as I'll talk, think, think about the various ways we can think about decolonization, I think are multiple, complex, maybe contradictory. Um, now what I want to do today is I'm going to first offer some very general thoughts just in response to the, the query for this series, which is how do we decolonize knowledge and what, what does that project look like? And then because I'm a, a, a nerdy historian and I love sources and archives, I'm going to talk about three rather different moments in French history and just talk through a little bit about how, how I think we can use sources in different ways and kind of think of them through, in a decolonizing process or, or use sources to think differently about certain larger narratives. Um, they're rather disparate. I have a bit of a, 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 a lack, lack of focus, some might describe it, or multiple foci. Um, but in, uh, in one, one is from a new book that I'm working on uh, called Seven Rivers and a Sea, which is a history of France and the Americas. So some examples about the relationship between France and Brazil in the 16th century. A second draws on work I've done for a while on the Haitian Revolution. Um, so sources around the Haitian Revolution and how we think about new ways of, of, of approaching that period. And then finally, some thinking about soccer and this kind of cultural politics of the moment. So I hope that that'll just give us enough to, to have a good conversation. Um, as I'm going, please feel free to ask questions or, or make comments about the sources as well. Um, I want to start, of course, that the, the, first, the first step for me, I think, and this is widely understood and shared, um, in the process of decolonization is first just acknowledging how profoundly the, the knowledge formations, the disciplines, the institutions that we're in, and the cultures of knowledge that we participate in um, were very much shaped by the history of colonialism. Right? I think that's, that's now pretty accepted. We see a very clear way in which, if you think about the 19th century origin, a lot of disciplines, anthropology among others, um, and their links to colonialism, that's something, again, scholars have, have kind of emphasized, um, I think, in, in important ways. Um, it's also true, of course, though, that I think going further back, and I'm very interested in that, to the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods, we now, I think, have a pretty robust sense that these worlds of thought in Europe were very much shaped by interactions with the Americas, uh, that there's kind of no place outside of the colonial project to think about those areas, that there was always sort of interactions. We can also think about Mediterranean histories, about deep histories of, of European-African interaction. So I think generally a disposition that understands that uh, sort of scholarship that separates out Europe from other areas of the world and kind of make, tries to create discrete intellectual genealogies will be missing a lot if we do that. Um, this is something, among others, that Achille Membe's uh, work, Critique of Black Reason, which I translated a few years ago, um, looks at the ways in which the very constitution of Africa and blackness were intertwined with the constitution of an idea of Europe and the West, really, again, going back many centuries, right? So that these categories are are basically imbricated from the beginning, and it's hard to separate them. And that's part of the challenge uh, in our work. So what this means, of course, is that the project of decolonizing knowledge, um, really like projects of political or cultural decolonization. Um, oops, what have I done? Sorry. We're not, we're not to Leon and Messi yet. So. Um, actually, here, what I'll do is. Um, 
So the projects of decolonizing knowledge, much like the projects of political and cultural decolonization, take place within a deeply anchored matrix, right? Um, that we're kind of stuck within it in certain ways. Um, it might be suffocating, except that there are ways, I think, of understanding, identifying this matrix critically, even when we're, we're intertwined in it in certain ways. Um, and it really means that a crucial part of any decolonizing project is first, I think, a careful, a thoughtful study of intellectual genealogies, right? Of doing kind of intellectual history, history of thought, and thinking critically about it. Um, and then in com comprehending and engaging with existing canons this, I think, also creates an opportunity for a lucid recasting and reorientation of how we approach certain questions, right? We're not trapped, I think, in any particular interpretive matrix, but we need to understand what's, what, what exists around us in order to perhaps craft new avenues. Um, but the other part of this is, of course, there's always been lots of other intellectual genealogies, right? We live in a very multiple world uh, with many different ways of thinking. Um, and these other genealogies can be studied and cultivated, including all the intellectual practices and traditions that emerged often from resistance to colonial forms, which has been a part of colonial history from the beginning. Um, obviously, resistance to colonialism is in certain ways imbricated with colonialism. It's not separated from it. Um, so uh, they, they are intertwined, but nevertheless, there's always been a project of imagining different types of possibilities than, for instance, the European economic systems that were imposed in colonial settings. Um, and it's also true, and this interests me quite a bit, I think, is that there's, there's many of these projects were also crafting their own historical understandings and narratives, right? So uh, understandings of history are often a part of kind of imagining different futures. Um, so those narratives imposed by colonial institutions in certain ways were often resisted by others. Um, and there's always been kind of battles over the nature and meaning of history within, within the colonial and anti-colonial projects. Um, I'll emphasize just one angle about this as a scholar of the Caribbean and some terms I find useful, which is within, I think, the American context, America's writ large, um, the economic and intellectual regimes connected to the slavery and the plantation system, of course, weigh very heavily on our world. Um, and the plantation system is a central point of reference for Caribbean scholars in the United States, of course, as well. Um, but we also need attentiveness to what a scholar I draw on a lot, Jean Casimir from Haiti, talks about as the counter-plantation system, right? So in all plantation systems, there was always other systems that were kind of being built against those systems. Deborah Thomas writes in her work on Jamaica, um, building on uh, the theorist Sylvia Winter, who I hope some of you have read, that the, the logic of the plantation undergirds all modern sovereignty projects, she writes, in the Caribbean, but that has always existed with its internal threat, the spaces within which enslaved people maintained as a conception of themselves as human rather than property, right? So a sense of, obviously, these de dehumanizing systems were always resisted with forms of, of humanization or of insisting on humanity. Um, Slavery and the plantation have not always been the dominant form of extraction in colonial regimes, but I think from where we're working in the Americas, they do uh, have a particularly strong weight and are a powerful force that structures the very possibilities of, of life and knowledge, structure, I think, a lot of thinking around economic regimes um, and that we should be particularly aware of. So I hope those first opening thoughts are just helpful as food for thought. Um, and then as we, I hope we can do this as a conversation I'll try to provide as much context as possible with these, but again, these are kind of just examples to think through how one might work through particular moments in, in new ways. Um, so I'm gonna start by just plunging us into the city of Rouen, a name, a, the name I love saying, so, 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 the, the, the Frenchest thing other than Laurent Dubois, possible. <laughs> so repeat after me, Rouen, it's R-O-U-E-N. Um, in 1550, so this is something that um, a, a number of scholars have written about, a kind of, somewhat well-known episode in European 16th century history when King Henri went to the city of Rouen, um, as he did at various moments, to kind of go and consult with local nobles and uh, assert his presence. And of course, when the king came to town, it was always the occasion to put on basically the biggest sort of event and party possible in order to impress the king. Um, and in this case, in Rouen in 1550, you can see a series of, um, there's these pretty incredible, to a couple of different manuscripts depicting it. These are not real elephants, they are fake elephants. They look very real, so they had um, a series of kind of exotic reference points to exotic animals. Um, they had, um, uh, there's just a, a little better detail on that, um, a chariot with death on it. Uh, there was a, a lot of, a lot of rep representation of death and mythical creatures. Here's another version of that. Um, 
a number of kind of people carrying depictions of various French cities, uh, another kind of interesting depiction of the region. Those are, uh, but at the heart of this whole thing, and you can just see it here in the corner, was an island in the middle of the Seine um, with indigenous Brazilians on it. So it was an island that is still there today. It's in the middle, if you've been to Guam or if you go at some point, um, there are several islands sort of in the middle of the river, which is quite broad at that point. And what they did was they, just, they kind of created a little version of Brazil in the middle of this river. So this is the Seine, remember the river that goes through Paris and to the ocean. Um, and on that island were two groups of people, but who were indistinguishable, at least in how they were presented, which was about 50 or so, or perhaps more, indigenous Brazilians who had been brought from Brazil for not only for this purpose, but were in, in wool. And then a, a larger number, perhaps 100 or 200 of French men and women who were dressed as Brazilians. Um, and a number of these are people who had actually spent a significant amount of time in Brazil. Um, they were known as touchement. Um, one of the tactics that the, the merchants of Normandy uh, did when they began to interact with Brazil in the early 16th century this was a colonialism that was basically unofficial. It was just carried out by local merchants, and they were getting access to Brazil wood, which is where the origin of the name comes from, in order to dye, to create red dye for fashionable red clothes, which were in the, in the, uh, in, in expanding at that time. Um, so, but one of the techniques that they used was that sometimes actually even young French boys or young men were left with indigenous tribes for a few years uh, where they learned languages and then became kind of parts of this kind of interaction with the French, right? So they were sort of adopted into these groups. Um, this history of the France in Brazil is relatively underknown, uh, but it really was the earliest part of French colonial history. Um, it started to happen at first because when French ships, like Portuguese ships, were trying to get around Africa, they would run into Brazil sometimes, essentially, if they got off course. So that's really, it was by accident that some of these developed. Um, but at this moment in 1550, and you can see a few other details, and it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's, there's these engravings of the island. You can kind of see a couple of details here. Hammocks, there were uh, a number of animals that had been brought from Brazil, parrots and monkeys uh, that were on the island as well. Um, and then the kind of climax of the event was a battle between two Brazilian tribes on this island, a kind of mock battle. Um, followed up by the French sinking a Portuguese ship in the, the middle of the river. Um, people just don't do things the way they used to anymore. But, um, so what struck me about this is that there's a literature that had write, written about this uh, a couple decades ago, Stephen Greenblatt and others, but primarily essentially through the mode of an early form of French exoticism, right? that this was a depiction of French exoticism. For me, though, what interpolated me from the beginning was who are these 50 indigenous Brazilians, right? And who are the, who are the French people who had, been in, who had been crossing the Atlantic, again, unofficially, without a kind of state process? And what, what were their lives like? What, were their, you know, what, were, what, was, what was their way of seeing the world? Um, I later learned then about an interesting story in 1502 of a mission of French that went to Brazil. Um, they spent some time on the Brazilian uh, continent. They then returned with a young man who was a kind of who had been basically the, the prince or kind of princeling of a tribe in order to bring him back and teach him about canons, which the indigenous people were quite interested in. They were never he was never able, he never went back. They weren't able to get back. And so instead he ended up marrying into a local sort of semi-aristocratic family. And there is actually this whole descendancy in Normandy of a kind of Brazilian indigenous French family that in the 18th century claimed this, claimed this descendancy and kind of wrote about it. Um, so you, which is to say that this was not sort of just like little trips, right? There were actually interactions at this very early stage between Brazil and France. Um, maybe the most famous referent to this, which some of you I'm sure have read, is Montaigne, who wrote an essay of cannibals, kind of often thought about like the earliest anthropological or cultural relativist essay, um, which is primarily making kind of critiques of France based on sort of what he says some indigenous Brazilians said to him about Europe, right? So the idea is like I told them they're cannibals, that's barbaric, and then they lay out all of the different barbarisms that they see in Europe, the wars of religion, uh, in, uh, wealth inequality, the fact that people are starving in the streets, etc. It's really the beginning, of course, of a very long tradition in French writing of using indigenous people to kind of critique French culture. Um, so I mention all this because this is just an early beginning of a much larger story. Um, 
It's something that uh, David Gravener and, and David Wengorf in, in, in a big book, a great book called The Dawn of Everything that some of you may have, have heard about argue is really actually fundamental to the emergence of enlightenment thought, which is an indigenous critique, right? That there is a kind of consistent depiction of indigenous people criticizing European culture um, and also Europeans encountering societies in which um, there's a very high level of individual freedom in many cases. Um, there are processes of deliberation um, in many North American uh, tribes, for instance, um, among the Iroquois, basically you had to convince all the, all the soldiers to go into war and they didn't have to go if they were not convinced by your sort of articulation of why there should be a raid. Um, so a high level of freedom even in the military realm. Um, systems of gender and family in which divorce was very easy, in which women had a surprising level of, of, of freedom. All of these things that kind of people, that Europeans so, sort of saw and wrote about. Um, interestingly, a large amount of that came through the Jesuit relations, which are, of course, these writings about indigenous societies that start in the 17th century and start as reports, but eventually become kind of best-selling books, little books um, that were read. A lot of women read these books in which they described in quite, quite a bit of detail indigenous societies, including these differences, um, as part of, obviously, a missionizing process, but the details of those cultures were nevertheless circulating. Um, so you have a kind of whole way and what David Wengrove and, and Gradner argue is that for a long time, scholars have, have often read these as sort of Europeans imagining what indigenous people would have said about Europe, or almost imagining that it was like an internal critique. And they argue, I think, with a lot of evidence that, that that's just a sort of a simpli simplification, that in fact, the actual conversations between indigenous people and French people, both in Europe and in the Americas, is actually influencing thought, right? That, there's, that these indigenous folks and their critiques um, are in fact part of the intellectual history of Europe and have an effect and ultimately help lay certain kinds of foundations for thinking about natural rights, freedom, um, and, and even kind of differences in gender structures. One book that is really fascinating that does this is a book by Joseph-François Lafitou, also a Jesuit, um, who wrote a, a book called Meurs des Sauvages, um, Américains comparés uh, aux meurs des, 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 des anciens temps. So it's kind of like it's a book about that takes indigenous societies in the Americas and compares them to ancient societies of Europe um, in quite a bit of detail. He's, particular, he's notably interested in the role of women in these different societies and different political organizations around gender. Um, so this book really was, and it's, we think sometimes under this rubric of just the noble savage, the construction of the kind of noble savage again as a kind of shorthand, but there was a really interesting dynamic here where it's sort of thinking about the classical the classical structures and thinking about the indigenous worlds also were intertwined and kind of shaped each other. Um, so I mentioned this, I just sort of put all this on the table as it's, it's part of a much larger conversation, but to think there are ways of us to, uh, for us to really think about the histories, the intellectual histories and the political thought of Europe and the Americas as being really imbricated, really interconnected. Um, and rather than sort of seeing a kind of solid or kind of, a, a kind of centralized West always emanating outwards and where it's thought is kind of internally produced. One sort of simple move at the beginning for, for thinking about decolonization um, is actually just to, I think, go into the history and see these currents, right, shaping one another um, and, and thinking of those in a, in a, in a quite complex way. Um, and it makes sense, of course, that the encounter across the Atlantic with new worlds would have had a profound impact on thought. There's no way that it wouldn't have, right? Um, but I think some of our methods for, for thinking about this have sometimes been a little too constrained and sometimes actually out of, um, with a good impulse, right, which is that a critique of European representations of other societies has been a central project for a long time. But sometimes that has led us, I think, to ignore um, the extent to which there really is a, a kind of interaction between them. So um, that's part one. So we have, I don't know if there's any, any questions, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next now, and we can come back to that. Um, now, the second example I want to give, oh, this, I'm sorry, this was one more image I wanted to show of Lafitou. Um, a lot of interesting depictions that sort of we're looking at customs and dress. Um, there's also, well, I won't go into the, this other stuff, but there's, there's a lot going on in these 18th century texts that's super interesting. I urge you to, to look into them if you're curious about that period. Um, now, we were just talking this morning about uh, Michel Rolf Trio's book, Silencing the Past, Power, and the Production of History, which has been a very influential work, cer certainly in the historical field, a uh, Haitian anthropologist um, who wrote, writes about the ways in which um, archives are produced 
produce silences as well as information, right? So the, his argument essentially is that there are all kinds of ways that are um, in which certain kinds of histories are silenced from the moment an event happens, then in the ways that archives are constituted. And these silences then affect what's, what's possible in our historical narration. So it's a kind, of, a, a kind of request for thinking critically about the way archives have been constituted. Um, now this work has really inspired a lot of thinking in Caribbean studies about how we engage with the archive and how we think creatively about that engagement. Uh, more recently, Marisa Fuentes and Celia Naylor, for instance, have, per, have uh, offered particularly rich engagements with this question on the question of women's histories in the Caribbean and the ways in which certain kinds of silenced histories can be reconstructed or engaged with. Um, so I want to just show a couple of documents relating to the Haitian Revolution um, that explore this question. The, the Haitian Revolutionary Archive is, is, is unique in some ways because unlike other insurrections or, or revolutions among enslaved people, it succeeded, right? So there's a kind of larger archive. There's an archive. People sort of took control and then they also took voice. Um, they ended up kind of writing and, and creating documents in a way that is, is less likely. Like in other cases, we really have repressive documents, right, or trials. Here is this different kind of set of archives. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is, in, in relationship to that, um, is that, you know, as these, so as this revolution created uh, new realities, it also created new archives. Um, but these materials really invite us to think carefully also about the question of language. Um, it's always been a kind of interesting question to think about what language the Haitian Revolution was carried out in, right? So what was the language of that revolution? Um, and I think this raises larger questions about the role of the written word versus the spoken word in revolutionary projects. Um, of course, as historians, we tend to use the written word, logically enough. I think sometimes we then sometimes overestimate the, the role of the written versus the oral in revolutionary contexts. Um, I think a lot of revolutionaries actually take place primarily through speech. That would have been the case in the French and American revolutions too. In the Haitian context, of course, that, that balance was probably more towards speech in part because many people didn't have access to literacy or the printing press and so forth. Um, but it's important not to sort of conflate writing with thought, of course. Um, people can have very abstract thoughts without writing. And that's important when we think about the Haitian revolution because at times or a lot of the work we've done is to try to really think through the intellectual history of, of the insurgents in, in the revolution as being an engagement with core philosophical political questions um, that, that were being debated in the French Revolution as well. Um, this document I've started with is just a, an interesting one that highlights the presence of multiple languages in the Caribbean and elsewhere. It's an Arabic text that's in the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, that comes out of a collection of a, of a man named Ducintia, who was a Swiss naturalist who traveled around the Caribbean and kind of collected curiosities and interesting things, um, and then moved to Philadelphia, where his, his collection resides. Um, and this was written by an enslaved man in Saint-Domingue, um, a long Quranic passage, right, that's repeated. Um, and part of, there's, there's one other Arabic document as well, um, but gives us a sense that among those enslaved, there would have been people who had been educated in chronic schools, and even though in this new context would be able to reproduce that and continue to practice Islam. Um, this is a phenomenon known throughout the Americas, and of course, uh, you may be familiar with Rian and Giddens actually did a recent opera about a man in the 19th century in North Carolina who actually wrote his autobiography in Arabic um, and became kind of figure in that period. Uh, so that's one thing, is just a, that Islam and Arabic were part of this world. Um, Another kind of piece of this is how to think about Haitian Creole. Now, Haitian Creole is a language that we know is emerging by the mid 18th century. There are actually plays written in Haitian Creole that we have manuscript versions of from the 1750s already. Um, and it's, I think, a, a reasonable assertion that the most, most spoken languages in Haiti during the revolution would have been Haitian Creole, and then probably Central African languages, which were, which was the Central Africa being the place where the majority of people enslaved had come from. Um, we're, we're lucky in the sense that the Haitian, during the Haitian Revolution, figures actually understood the centrality of Creole, and there's a series of proclamations issued by the French government in Creole. Um, so this was done, especially in 1793, when it's a crucial moment in the Haitian Revolution when they're abolishing slavery. Um, and there's a series of proclamations. We have about 15, 20 versions of these in different places now. This is from the John Carter Brown Library. Um, 
there wasn't a set orthography for Creole, so some of this was sort of experimental. But there are these really interesting documents in which they're basically laying out the kind of French uh, proclamation of, of freedom and trying to incorporate people into this French mission in Creole. Now, interestingly, of course, most of the people in Haiti would not have been able to read this document. Um, so these were really made to be read. Um, they were made to be read in kind of large settings on plantations um, elsewhere. Um, but this is a recognition. And the other person who did this actually was Napoleon also issued proclamations in Haitian Creole later um, during 1802 war. Um, so this is just a, a, of significance in part because it's a recognition, kind of an unusual recognition that a sort of a vernacular language essentially that had been created in this context was important and central enough that you really couldn't get something done without speaking in it. Right? Um, and that gives us some insight. And in fact, there's a lot to be done here of just like close analysis of the Creole in this text because it weren't direct translations. We can try to think about who would have made those translations, what words they would have used. Um, Michel Rolf-Trio, who I mentioned earlier, interestingly, his very first book was A History of Haiti written in Creole. And part of his challenge or interest in that was to uh, explain concepts like dialectical materialism using only Haitian Creole language or proverbs, for instance. It's a really interesting work, but you can kind of think about what, you know, what translation and kind of uh, finding the right terms for things involves in these cases. Um, but so this is a way of getting at, I think, essentially at some kind of decolonizing move where, because the language of Creole obviously is embedded or embeds and kind of uh, communicates a lot of concepts that are emerging from a different culture, a culture that's obviously emerging, emerging from colonialism, but also articulating against it. Um, and for many people who study the Creole language today, I think consider it right as space of all kinds of knowledge forms and thinking about the world that are alternatives to or resistant to uh, the colonial project. Now we can get another insight into this world from I think one of my favorite archival documents from this period, which is um, where I think people are familiar with the, the, the idea that the names of enslaved that were listed in plantation registers all over the Americas were often not really the names people used for themselves, right? They're often kind of projected onto people. Um, in, in, uh, in Saint-Domingue, for instance, there's a very large number of, of names that are taken from like plays, from Rousseau and Voltaire plays, right, that are kind of or various uh, ancient names, et cetera. Um, and we know that underneath those names, there were other names that tended to be used. But it's very, very difficult to know what those names are, logically enough, because they were more secret. But this is a document that in 1792, Toussaint at the time, was actually fighting with the Spanish. And he um, just writes down the names of his troop as a kind of indication of who's under his command. And what you can see here is a list of people's names as they would say them themselves, right? There's no, there wasn't a reason for them to use someone else's name for themselves. Um, there's a, it seems like at least one woman, because there's a, a name in Creole that still exists, which is Sefi, which is literally like, it's a girl. Um, that was a, um, and there's a few other examples, uh, and someone named Petro, which is actually a term in the Haitian Vodou language. So there's a lot, of, a lot here you can see. Just another example where you know, a space opened up and you could kind of get insight into this phenomenon that is often hidden in the Americas, which is that there was another, another name behind the names, right? Um, so that's another example. And you can see there, obviously, different, a different language, a different set of languages being used as well. Now, the last um, case are kind of some examples from Haitian uh, Vodou, which is a religion that um, was in many ways in formation in the 18th century. The word vodou itself was, was written down in a couple of documents in the 18th century, but sometimes just describing parts of the religion. It's not totally clear when the, that name itself kind of gets codified. And obviously, the religion itself is shaped very much and shapes the Haitian Revolution. Um, people might be familiar with the fact that, that the, sort of the date of the launching of the Haitian Revolution is usually sort of set at a, a religious ceremony at Bois-Caimon where people gathered together um, and planned the revolution, but also sort of took an oath um, and called on the gods to help in the struggle to come. Um, and there's a lot of evidence of Vodou playing a very, very important role in the, revolu in the revolution of religion at that time, and since, of course, that, that relates to and integrates with Catholicism in lots of different ways. Um, but what's interesting about the Vodou uh, song canon is that there's this really, really large number of songs. Um, thousands and thousands that are sung up to the present day, um, many of which have very specific historical reference, right? Sometimes to the point of like 
very, very specific reference to a particular commander in the 1870s. Or, um, and these are kind of kept alive in different sort of tr temple traditions. Um, we're lucky that in the 1950s, a French anthropologist, uh, Odette Menesson Pigot, <coughs> gathered a lot of these songs and wrote them down. So this is an, this is an image of one of those songs. Um, so there's a kind of snapshot in time from about now 70 years ago of, of songs. Um, this is a really interesting one. I just put it up here in order to show uh, the specificity of some of these. There's a period during the Haitian Revolution where Dessalines, who is mo you know, mostly known as the founder of Haiti, right, the kind of heroic founder who declared independence in January. But there's a whole period where he actually fought with the French against insurgents, right, where he was sort of on the other side. Um, and a lot of the people who, were, who he was fighting against were kind of African-born, smaller groups in the mountains who sort of held on for a crucial period. Trio writes about this as well. And this song actually describes that period. So it describes, it says, it says very interestingly, Dessalines sorti en France, like Dessalines came from France. Um, he was carrying a new wonga. A wonga is kind of an object of power. Um, and he was carrying this wonga to kill Jean-Pierre Ibo. So Jean-Pierre Ibo. Uh, the last name of an African group. Um, this Ali came out here. He was carrying a woman Ibu to kill the Ibo nation, right? So he is coming to kill the Ibo nation. Um, he was trying to kill my mother's nation. He was trying to kill my father's nation. Um, so it's actually a very intense depiction um, that if you think about being sung still in 1950 in a country where Dessaline is understood, you know, like the Jefferson of Haiti, was recalling a particular time when he was, you know, on the other side, right? And so, um, so very interesting, I think, to see how that kind of historical memory, which which really goes against, you know, kind of patriotic history in deep ways, was was re was residing in this place. Um, I'm going to show now, or I'm going to play now, actually, um, two. Uh, let's see here. Uh -oh. Sorry. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, great, sorry. Okay, um, I'm gonna play one song, uh, and I'll sort of show back the lyrics. These are two um, that I think are particularly potent because they're both songs about the Middle Passage. Um, so there's a certain a number of songs that kind of narrate the Middle Passage, and narrate them as part of a kind of broad epic um, across time. <laughs> Um, and this particular one, which is called Sous la Mer, which basically just means on the ocean. Um, it, uh, I'll start playing it and I'll show the lyrics. <laughs> I don't know if anyone here speaks Creole. I know they teach Creole in their day, but um, so what he's saying here is he's saying we're 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 navigating on the ocean. We're sailing on the ocean, right? So um, the next line, Agwe Taboyo, is the calling on a god, the kind of god of the ocean, Agwe Enoyo. Um, and then the next line, which is interesting, sort of says like there's going to be a time when they see us, or there's going to be a time when we'll come for them, basically, I think is how I interpret it. Um, like, this, these things are going to turn around, right? Um, and then it describes, like, they took our feet, they took our, our, took our wrists, um, they, they tied them together, and they threw us in the, in the bottom of the slave ship, right? Um, so it's really just literally describing this experience. Um, what I think is interesting about this song is that there, it's sung in the present tense, right? So it's sung in a, in a context in which you're sort of brought back into that experience. Um, and later in the song, describes kind of being on a ship with the with the with weight with the with the storm on the ocean, right? Um, and water coming on the ship, and the ship is going to sink. Basically, um, it's almost going to sink. We're going to go into the bottom of the ocean. He says, um, and in this ship, we all become one. Is what the kind of so it's embarcadement tout se un. So that sense that like this is the moment of kind of coming of coming together of becoming who we are as a nation, sort of in the in the ship itself, is kind of narrated here. I think that's 
particularly powerful in relation to Vodou, which is a you know a, a religion that brought African traditions to the New World, but also this sense that the kind of the origin in some ways of the nation is in that experience, right? Um, it's a reminder of, of a kind of important demographic fact about the Haitian Revolution, which is that most people during that revolution had been African born. So the majority in Haiti were people who had been born and raised in Africa. I mean, literally like fifth, over 50%. And um, a majority of that group was from Central Africa and the Congo. Um, so this experience was something that at that time was, you know, people quite literally remembered, right? That they, they the people who kind of founded Haiti, most of them had had that, that direct experience. Um, So the next one I want to show is um, has subtitles, so I don't have to do the translation. Um, and this is a film we did in something that I co-directed called The Haiti Lab back at Duke uh, in 2010. Um, El Josué is a musician. He's a priest in the Vodou tradition. He's also the director now of the Bureau d'Ethnologie, which is a Haitian sort of center for ethnography, a government uh, center in Haiti. Um, and he sung this song. Um, we did some, some publishing and work together on this question of, of Vodou songs in history. And this was one that he chose to sing, again, kind of partly ev evoking the Middle Passage, but this longer history. <laughs> So I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to, to remove the, the bar. Does anyone have a clever? Uh, okay, sorry. The song repeats, so you haven't missed anything. Really. <laughs> So yeah, I'm sorry that you didn't get to see maybe the words too clearly, but he's basically saying, you know, the, the main line is like, since I've left Africa, people have been testing me, right? Sonde is the word that's like both in French and Creole. Um, and then it's sort of like, but, you know, um, I'm the root, I'm the rock, right? It's a kind of story of survival, of kind of connectivity. Um, and a couple of these things, like, um, they tried to catch me and I turned to smoke, which is probably a reference to this uh, a sort of version of Macondal, who was an insurgent leader who it was, it was said uh, when they burned him at the, snake, at the stake, he had sort of escaped and turned into smoke, right, and still lived in the hills. So references to certain moments like that that people would kind of get. Um, but here, of course, just this basic sense of, of kind of survival, right, and, and kind of long-term history. The reason I mention all this is because, and I wrote a piece about this, uh, about the Haitian Revolution and Haitian Vodou song, is that uh, when you take this corpus together, you do see, not, it's not necessarily that they're narrating historical events, but there's a set of historical interpretations being offered, right, about the nature of the continuity. In some cases, there are historical reflections about the creation of Vodou itself as a religion. So there is a kind of set of historical interpretations here. And I say that just to suggest that here you can see other ways of seeing the history um, that connect things in a different way than you might using, again, maybe more colonial categories or colonial archives. Um, so now we get to turn to soccer. I'll be done. Um, oh no, oh my god, sorry, it's terrible. Oh god, please stop, yeah. Okay, that's always my greatest fear, and it's come to pass. Okay. Um, so, what I, um, I began writing about French soccer in 2006, primarily as uh, therapy for um, Zidane headbutting an Italian player and then France losing the World Cup in 2006. So, um, as a good academic, the only thing I could do was to turn it into a topic of 
analysis and research. Um, <laughs> it ended up becoming a book and then a class that I've taught. Um, but what I was struck by as I began to, so the basics, right, which you might be familiar with, is that for the last several decades, the French teams that have you know, won, won in 1998, now won in 2018, went to the final in 2022, um, have been a, a teams predominantly of people of African descent. Um, uh, Caribbean, African players, North African players, also other immigrant players, and there's a history of you know, Armenian immigrants, Polish immigrants, um, other groups as well. But a team that really represents a very, very a, a broad range of kind of ancestry right, and identities, as I talked about at the beginning. Um, what I didn't know when I started research, researching this is that there's a kind of, that's actually a deep history. In fact, French national soccer stands out in European soccer in that there have been uh, players from these other communities that are part of the team since really the beginning, actually. Like, there's actually never been national teams in France that didn't have some North African or African players. Also, interestingly, found this photograph of Jules Rimet, who is the person who created the World Cup, who is a French, Frenchman um, who, in the wake of World War I, with others, believed that a national tournament like the World Cup would help bring nations together in order to avoid war, right, a kind of peaceful encounter. Um, this photo, though, shows, interestingly, that he was, um, it, I've done, sort of, we had to ask a lot of people to figure this out. This is actually Jules Rimet with African-American troops. Um, because, as some of you may know, when the U.S. troops were sent to in World War I, they separated out the African American troops and put them in the French army under French commanders as a way of maintaining kind of segregation in the U.S. army. Um, and one of the things they asked the French commanders was not to fraternize with their the African American soldiers. So anyway, this this stands out as a kind of interesting image. But again, Rimet himself, part of these experiences, um, already I think being affected by this, this global landscape. Um, just to show you a few examples, um, the 1938 French national team that went and played in a World Cup famously hosted by Mussolini um, in Italy uh, included Ra Raoul Dian, who is the son of Blaise Dian, who is a, an important politician from West Africa, who was part of the political landscape of France for, for many decades, and, and Raoul was his son who grew up in Paris. Um, Laubi Ben Barek, who was a young player from uh, Morocco, who was actually kind of an early star recruit to, to a team in France, also played on the team during this period um, after, after World War II. Um, I've already mentioned the case of Karen Bouin-Turham. By 1998, this becomes kind of a symbol of the team, although it's been the case for a long time. Um, and really what happened in, in the 90s was that this kind of presence of players which had never really been politicized or named as, a, as an issue becomes named because the French, as I mentioned, Le Pen kind of attacks the team. And that politicizes the team and sort of, in fact, a number of players begin to really talk and research the French colonial history. Turam, um, Karim Bou, others, um, Karim Bou actually speaks out quite a bit about the history of New Caledonia and kind of teaches a lot of French people who are not aware of that history, of the Kanak people, et cetera. Um, Juham and others talk about the history of slavery, et cetera. Um, so you get this kind of politicization, and there's almost a sense that the French, you know, the French locker room was a little bit like a history seminar at times. You know? um, Bernard Lama, who was a Guyanese, sort of teaching others about it. So, um, and, and, and Turam, who, as many of you maybe know, went on to found an anti-racist education foundation afterwards, has written several books. Um, about black history, about whiteness, um, curated an exhibit at the Kibhani about colonialism and representation. So a, a, a pretty striking figure who sort of used his, his um, sort of fame from, from World Cup for those ends. Um, Turan became famous in 1998 because he is a defender. He actually played 142 games for the French national team and only ever scored two goals, and they were both in the same game, and it was a semifinal of the World Cup. And they were both kind of by accident, um, but in the second, and the, because he basically allowed one goal to go in and then kind of literally 30 seconds later scored another goal. But after his second one, he did this famous thinker pose, which became a little bit of his identity. It was kind of maybe the greatest goal celebration ever. Um, so. Um, and here's Zidane then scoring the goal in the final. Um, but in that 1998 moment, you had essentially Tuham and then Zidane, the kind of heroes of the semifinal and finals, who then, you know, a Caribbean and an Algerian player came to represent, you know, something really special in France in that period. Um, now we fast forward a little bit uh, to 2005. In 2005, there was the two, two these two young men were, died um, while running away from the police after, after going to play soccer, actually. They went to play soccer. It was Ramadan. They didn't have their papers with them. Um, they kind of came back and were chased um, and went into an electrical 
station to get away from the police and were electrocuted. Um, and this started about a month long of, of major kind of protests, basically a, a nationwide insurrection in a lot of projects throughout France. Um, and it also then a lot of these uh, soccer players began to speak out about this, in part because most of them had grown up in the neighborhoods, these, these kind of neighborhoods. And you know, there was a connection with these younger kids. Um, so Lilian Turham and others spoke out. Um, there was a curfew. So this is Le Guignol de l'Info, which is a kind of comedy show in France that kind of pointedly pointed this. So there was a curfew at one point um, that said that you know, no one could stay out after five um, in these neighborhoods. And Le Guignol de l'Info <coughs> pointed out what that would do to the team. You know, which was that so it was basically like how many of them were in these neighborhoods that were kind of under curfew. Um, then in 2006, so just shortly afterwards, you have this team. Again, m almost all of the players on this team had grown up in Malu neighborhoods or, or projects. Um, and uh, many of them had spoken about this experience in the last month. This is the World Cup that then culminates with Zidane's headbutt, um, which is an, an event that then cul that kind of crystallizes and brings together all these larger issues about kind of race and identity and immigration in the way that it's, I won't, I won't spend five hours talking about that right now. You can, if you really want to do that, there's a book about that there, but, um, but it is a kind of really interesting moment um, and one in which I think you can see how something like sport can kind of allow for multiple voices and different ways of seeing things uh, as well. Um, so one more image from there. And this is just a, a quote that I always think is kind of interesting. So 2006, Le Pen, was basically repeating things he had said a long time. Essentially, there are too many players. Why are there so many black players on this team? It doesn't represent France. Um, and Lilian Turham said, yeah, he said, il a, il a, so he says there's too many black players. This is very interesting, actually, very true on the thing to say. He says, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond because I personally am not black. Which people were like, what do you mean? You know, when he explains, like, Mr. Le Pen, what he was sort of saying is, like, the reason I'm on the soccer team and me being black are unrelated. You know, like, it's just that I'm French, so I'm on the team, right? Um, and then he says, Monsieur Le Pen, uh, he, doesn't, he seems not to know that there are black French, blonde French, brown haired French. What surprises me is someone who keeps running for president doesn't know anything about the history of France, right? Um, <laughs> and then he says, I'm so proud, I'm very, very proud of being French. He might have a problem, but we don't have a problem. Long live France, not the one he wants, the true France. Right? Um, so this idea of claiming, this is why he's saying the Nazis, like, that they're sort of claiming like, well, this, this is France, not your version. right? Um, uh, he does this a lot with Turham, so saying these great things. Now, wonderfully enough, his son, Marcus Turham, and I'll, complete, I'll, I'll finish him soon, um, is now a star in his own right. He played a really critical role in the, uh, the World Cup in 2022. And he's lately been celebrating his goals by doing this, which is force et intelligence, which is like you know, strength and power. I'm sorry, no, strength and intelligence, um, which is to some extent a repose to, we're familiar with the fact that a lot of commentaries often talk about black players as having you know, power rather than intelligence, right? And so he's kind of, he's sort of suggesting that they have both. Um, and I'll just complete, I'll just end with a brief moment of joy and sadness, which is the, the final of the, uh, the 2022 World Cup, and then we can go to questions. Um, so just because in this game, uh, which was, I'm just going to say it, the, most, the best sporting event in the history of the world, <laughs> um, just the perfect narrative. I also was very proud of myself because weeks earlier I said, Mbappe, Messi in the final. You know, so it's, okay. um, but just to sort of suggest that what happened in the second half of that game when France came back and Argentina was really the, it was the result of Marcus Turam and, and Lilian Turam and several other players, but there's this kind of interaction between them that I think really crystallizes beautifully um, uh, that, that kind of ethos. So I think I can show this here. At this point, I believe that it was over. But it was not. <laughs> I was watching this game in the car sending all of this for. Now, he'll steer back inside Turok, and Mbappe! 
Martinez with I'll stop there at the height of joy, then it gets a little sadder. But, <laughs> not kids, but, um, but I just, uh, on, on that higher note, just to suggest, I think that partly we could, if we can do what the French soccer team does, we can successfully decolonize ourselves. So um, uh, that's my last point. I'm happy to have questions. <laughs> Yes. Certainly, in the interest of time, thank you. And I want this. I think is a topic for several more conferences from from you and the many skills you have. But yesterday, the Vatican formally repudiated the doctrine of discovery mm -hmm. used to justify colonization, mm -hmm. officially declaring that um, an historic policy used to justify colonial exploitation is quote not part of the teaching of a Catholic Church, unquote. Mm -hmm. More topics from you, please. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I did not know that, actually. Um, so, I mean, I, that's really fascinating. I think it's true that even in the history of the church, right, there were lots of debates, and there were a number of times when people came to the church to, at the time to even criticize or repudiate slavery, um, including indigenous kind of converts, et cetera. So there's a history there that seems like not to have finally culminated well, right? In many cases, the church didn't do that, right? And they kind of allowed or, or um, but I would say there too, there's often been multiple you know, versions. Um, it just makes me think of, there's a book, uh, my colleague Ada Ferrer, who's a historian at NYU, wrote a book about Cuba in the 19th century. And there's a man named Aponte, who was a Cuban insurgent who began to, who tried to start a, an uprising to end slavery and make Cuba independent. Um, and he was a, a, he was a Catholic, he was a craftsman, he had, he had created sort of sculptures in the church, and he also created a book of images. And in that images, there were several images of kind of black Africans and people from the Americas going to the Vatican and kind of asking for, you know, for change. So it's just just to suggest that the, these histories were being nurtured, I think, too. So um, that's a partial response. Yeah. The question here. Uh, thank you so much. It's all been absolutely fascinating. I really appreciate it. Uh, apropos, uh, of course, we know that some of the popes had uh, slaves and they gave them as gifts to other mm -hmm. people, but. I wanted to bring up, uh, I'm uh, very much uh, intrigued by your book, uh, Haiti, The Aftershock. And um, in the idea of decolonization, I've been terribly impressed with Paul Farmer. Mm -hmm. I see you don't actually write about him in that particular book, but you do refer to his work. But he uh, then, as this young American brought up in a very, very poor background, and then started the whole Partners in Health through Harvard. Uh, it seems to me, and I want your opinion, I'm just really saying what to, uh, to get a reaction from you. Uh, he really was into decolonization because he went to Hawaii, uh, to Haiti, excuse me. He went to Haiti, he learned Creole, and then he went to the very poorest sections. And then eventually, uh, it was all set to set up a whole health system for Haiti when Aristide was mysteriously taken out. And then he set it up in another, uh, another African country, in Rwanda, which Rwanda, is yeah. Rwanda, mm -hmm. and which is really, in Rwanda, for example, um, the maternal health has uh, decreased, the infant uh, survival rate has decreased. But my question is, did you know Paul Farmer? Did you work with him at all? And did you have any impression of what he was doing? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, Paul Farmer was actually very inspirational. Actually, when I was an undergraduate, uh, writing, starting to work on Haiti. His work was just coming out, actually. He was, he, he was an anthropologist. Um, he actually got his degree from Duke in anthropology, and he, he went and did ethnographic work. And his first, first, first book is about the kind of emergence of AIDS in Haiti um, and what happened in rural communities. Um, and that, that's what I read, again, very formative for me. And I, I did have the opportunity later to, to, to work with him and talk with him and do some events with him um, before he passed away, sadly. Um, but. I think that, and that project really was based on a kind of a horizontal relationship, let's say, with Haitians, right? To sort of um, not only the language, but also thinking about projects that would really nurture in infrastructure there um, in the long term. And Partners in Health have been really successful there, and it's one of the one of the organizations that people often hold out um, as in in negative, well, with comparing others uh, that have not done so well in that regard that have sort of imposed a vision. Um, part of it was just the longevity and the long-term commitment to institution building and actual structural building as well. So 
Um, I know less about the work in Rwanda, but I, my impression is that it followed similar things. So yeah, thank you for that question. And I think it's interesting that he started from an anthropological background, I think, to then construct that, right? Because I think that he had started from that kind of critique of an imposition, I think, of, of another culture. So, yeah. Another question here. Thank you. Thanks so much um, for your lecture. I'm so glad you brought up Paul Farmer. And one of the things, when you mentioned he was there to build a health system, he wouldn't frame it that way. He'd frame mm -hmm. it as, I'm using accompaniment to work with. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. I think of accompaniment, um, decolonization is, is part of that, I think. Mm -hmm. It's just part of what we aspire to at Geo. Right, Thank yeah. You. Oh, yeah. by the way, oh. Trevor Noah, yes. um, I don't know if you saw the clip uh -huh. where there's a, a black man that's saving a baby. Yes, so he's yes, He's coming yeah. over the balcony, mm -hmm. and they give him honorary citizenship, and he's got a whole, whole riff, riff on yeah, what yeah. you're talking about, soccer players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he has some very, he had a lot of riffs on the soccer team as well. So, um, yeah, I was going to just say, I do think that, that, you know, I think there's part of the other, the reason the history is interesting is these various histories of alliance or support, right? Or, um, I mean, actually, Sontonax, who's the, that, that document in Creole, um, you know, is a case of somebody who, who worked in alliance with insurgents in, in Saint-Domingue and, and sort of collectively they abolished slavery. So there's, I think, a lot of cases of that um, in the Haitian Revolution, notably, that, you know, are, are just interesting to know, so. Yeah. Another question here. Thanks so much. Uh, it was um, a, a great uh, template you've given us for studying the Caribbean um, based on the um, plantation cultures you describe it and the connection to African and uh, to a lesser extent Indian slavery in those institutions. Is your decolonization approach transferable to say Oceania? Tahiti and, and areas that did not depend on Africa or did not have that mm -hmm. plantation structure? That's a great question. I mean, I do think that obviously each locality, you know, does have its very specific histories. Um, and then at the same time, there are some continuities and consistencies in, in the colonial structure, right, or the ways that, um, that colonizing power structure regimes. Um, but there are parts of the plate, there, there are certain different kinds of economic regimes and that those make a huge difference, certainly in the long term. I mean, I think that the, the plantation regimes of the Caribbean have been very hard to get out of, to escape, right? So they're sort of, they set up a certain kind of economic reality that has, that continues to shape into the present day what's possible in certain ways. Um, I think in other parts of the world, the colonial impact was not quite as profound and so other economic possibilities you know, after decolonization emerge. So some of it has to do with ha the longevity of the impacts in different places. Um, so in that sense, the Caribbean and Africa and India, for instance, have very different experiences. It's true that some of the sort of the smaller islands in the Pacific, I do think have some parallel, sort of parallel histories to the Caribbean or in the, in the Indian Ocean colonies. So, um, I mean, it's also true that there are forms of empire that are not European forms of empire. You know, there, I think one can think about this very broadly when you're thinking about notably Asia, um, where there's a whole other set of conversations to be had about, you know, different different forms of empire that are, have existed there too. So, another question. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we're gonna choose them. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was for ending on a note of soccer. You know, <laughs> European team. We just laughed. A very specific question. Um, when you think about decolonizing scholarship in French and Francophone studies, yes. is there anything specific about that type of decolonizing scholarship in comparison to decolonizing history in more generally? Mm -hmm. I do think so. I think partly, um, I mean, I think there's a, there's a specific role in place that the French Revolution, that the French Enlightenment and all those elements played in the history of knowledge formations, right? Um, and into the 19th and 20th century, there's also particular kind of, in, there's, you know, the French and Francophone traditions, we want to think of them that way, um, in, including of anti-colonial thought of Fanon, et cetera. Um, so I, I would say that um, there's differences to that, and there's just a different valence. I think, you know, different forms of colonialism operated in different ways. They left different imprints. But I do think there's a, one could sort of lay out the genealogy, the particular genealogy of French thought in kind of global context. I also think that for me, a lot of the question has to do with the question of universalism. Um, and so, I mean, part of the argument in my earlier books is that what is often claimed as 
an invention of the French Revolution, a certain kind of radical universalism, in fact, had its truest form in the Caribbean, right? Because it was in the Caribbean that people insisted that you couldn't have slavery, right? And, you know, so the French Revolution without the Haitian Revolution would have done what the American Revolution did was, you know, declare universal rights but accept slavery as this giant contradiction, right? Um, whereas it's in Haiti that you push beyond that. Um, so in that sense, it feels to me that that's a fundamental. Now that was happening in relationship to the French Revolution and French history, um, but it was it was pro propelled by actions of enslaved people in the Caribbean. Um, so that's I think that so that was one of the first thing, sort of moves I tried to make in terms of decolonizing scholarship was just to say that what is claimed by Europe is in fact the result of a much larger process, and in fact that people who are fighting against colonialism were were motors for that. Um, so, yes. If you may just what one one said, it, um, I don't mean if I put it. The the person who presented the final draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on mm -hmm. December 9th, the night before December 10th, 1948, was a person of Haitian descent whose mm -hmm. ancestors were slaves. Who was that? Is it? I, I forgot the okay. name. It's easy to find Emil something. But but the, the, Haiti, former slave, mm -hmm. and then this idea of uh, yeah. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, universal. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that, uh, yeah, I, that Declaration of Human Rights, I think is, I mean, because that, and, and Latin America and the Caribbean had, I think, a very strong impact on um, the reason that declaration has so many things about social rights and economic rights, yeah. right? That's a very broad notion of rights. And I do think that that's another case where these, yeah, essentially anti-colonial or different traditions in the Americas, you know, saw that as a core, right, rather than sort of additive, yeah, so. Another question over here. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. As I've mentioned, there is no better book, at least I found, for teaching about France and issues of uh, race and migration than Soccer Empire. My students always put on their evaluations that was their favorite book that they read. Um, and thinking about that, and thinking about your presentation, I'm wondering to what extent you see decolonizing scholarship as and really decolonizing our teaching as reflected in the types of sources we're using. Mm -hmm. I mean, it strikes me that the sources that you were talking about today are overwhelmingly visual sources. Mm -hmm. Song, um, so. thinking about um, soccer itself as a topic, and how, to me, it strikes me that you know maybe decolonizing scholarship and kind of thinking critically about what Europe is also involves not just looking beyond the beyond the borders of Europe but rather kind of rethinking the types of sources and stories that we tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think very much. And I, th I think that to some extent, sometimes I've just, with my students, as first, I think decolonizing scholarship will make for better history, right? It's just kind of, you know, the, if the whole point is to have as many and multiple perspectives, sources, right? That's, that's sort of the ethic of the historian, right? To not ignore any possible way of interpreting, to not stay in one narrow lane. So I think in some ways, the more we multiply, the better off we are, right? So it's kind of, I think it's important to reiterate that it's a way of, it's still a way of getting at the, the history and the, the truth of that history. Um, I do agree, though, I think that partly, you know, colonial regimes, one of the things they did is that they, they kind of controlled the, the, the means of, 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 of text production, you know, they, they kind of, they created, and they also generated massive amounts of text, right? These were very administrative bureaucratic systems. Um, and so one of the things that can happen is you can become almost taken in by the, the, the loud-mouthed archive, you know? So, so the, the archive is very loud with certain voices, right? I think if, if you ever work in colonial sources, you'll at some point realize there's some colonial administrator who just wrote tons of memoirs, you know? And it's possible to sort of spend all your time reading the memoirs, critiquing the memoirs, right? And there's, not that there's not a value to that, but then you're sort of still basically in, in, in fundamentally in relationship with that voice, you know? Um, and so I think that's, that's the point. This is what TRIO calls us to do too, is just to make sure that you're um, not projecting into that moment the kind of vision of one dominant source. Um, but there's lots of things that can be done just with just reading differently, you know, as well. So, and Arlette Favre, who's a historian I really like of, of 18th century France, does this also for women's histories. And um, so it's true, you know, I think it's true in lots of different cases. Um, one can return very much to, this, to, to the written sources and read them differently. And, um, and, and there, there are ways of using the, what, the, what the colonial archive produced, uh, you know, against itself as well, which a lot of historians do, so. Emile Zolo. Huh. That's great. I did not know that. In Minnesota.
So my, my argument is always that Belgians and Haitians are you know the most important groups in history. Because I'm Belgian. Um, so, uh, but uh, oh, so. Oh, just left us. Our business manager at Kiosko, he's also Belgian. She just left us. Well, there you she go. Was here in your and the business manager is the most important person in any we organization. Know, we know. So, yeah. So there we go. Further proof of my thesis. Yeah. So. Uh, Another yes. question here. Uh, yes. Just one other comment. Of course, it is wonderful to think that perhaps the French soccer team would be the model for um, people getting along, but it actually doesn't carry over into French society. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, and so my question is, do you see any way that it has carried over? I don't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, human beings, you know, are, are, I mean, I do think that it's on its own, you know, obviously these, the, there are structural issues and economic issues and politic politicians stirring up issues and so forth. So. Um, I do think that it makes a difference, though, over time, you know, and I think that it's made a difference in how French people see themselves. The way that I wrote a piece about the team, the French team in the New York Times, uh, this World Cup, which was looking at, so even in, in 1998, the players really had to say, like, we are, you know, they were, they were kind of confronting this, right? We are French. We deserve to be French. We make this. Um, this generation doesn't do that, right? And and there is a way in which it, it would, it, I think it would feel absurd to most French people to say, like, Kylian Mbappe is not French, you know? He's in every ad for luxury watch in Paris you know he is very very French you know like so his and, and, and what I mean by that is I think for younger people um, there is a way in which lots of things have, have done this but the French soccer team also I think has helped to see in part and the reason sport can be powerful in this sense is I think people feel really really intense connection to the sporting figures they love right um, there is a way it's almost like you you kind of cross bodies with them you know you can literally do this if you play the FIFA video game you can be kind of, um, but I think so the intensity of the emotion that and you I think for many French people will sort of say like the most joyous public experience they've had in you know, and maybe in their lives is often when these World Cups have been won or so forth, right? Because people kind of commune. Now it's true that three days later, those same people may, you know, like it's not a, it's not a solution, um, but I think it has its place um, and it's, it's better this way than, if, than, than the other, right? Sport can also be used to really highlight difference and, and in many cases, so it's, it, you know, I would rather this version than that, you know, so. Yeah. Any final questions? I think it's been very enriching, very exciting. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.